Well, good morning, everybody. As Christians, we believe in God and we believe the Bible because basically the Bible is our foundation document, right? If it wasn't for the Bible, we wouldn't know who God is. We wouldn't really know what Christianity is all about. So the Bible is, is pretty fundamental. In fact, it's incredibly fundamental to our faith. But this morning, I just want to talk about why I or we should believe the Bible. It's an old book. It's been scorned. It's been criticized over the years. So why do we want to believe the Bible? Well, before I came to really believe the Bible, I was an evolutionist. Of course, shown up on the screen there, the evolutionary idea that we started as monkeys or some form of monkey and we gradually progressed through those stages. One of those sta stages there, the third one, Nebraska man, um, he was actually built up from one tooth. That whole picture they created of Nebraska man, one tooth, which turned out to be the tooth of an extinct pig. Um, the next one, actually no, I'll leave the next one, Piltdown man. Um, the, the next one, Peking man, supposedly 500,000 years old, but all evidence of that's disappeared. You know, makes you think. Come back to Piltdown man, the fourth one there. Well, in 1912, a gentleman by the name of Charles Dawson announced to the world that he'd discovered an intermediary between apes and man, Piltdown man, because he supposedly discovered it in an area known as the, the Piltdown Pits in, in England. Um, turned out it was an absolute fraud. It was a fake. He'd taken an old skull from a medieval graveyard, um, put some chemicals on it, got a jaw from an orangutan, joined it together, made it look old, presented it to the world, and for about 40 years, till 1953, it was regarded as factual. 40 years. He, he, he tricked the world. But that's not the worst of it, because I was still getting taught in 1981 that this was fact in our biology textbooks. Um, I hope it's still not being taught, but certainly in 81 it was. So you do the maths. 1953, it was exposed as a fraud. To 1981, how long is that? 28, almost 30 years. That the world knew Piltdown Man was a fraud, but we were still getting taught it in schools. That tells you something about the evolutionary psyche. You see... Evolutionists criticise we Christians as just being people of blind faith and, and whatever. But there's dishonesty going on in this so-called scientific world of ours. And that's a classic example. You all know what this is. This is one of those lovely, cuddly, big panda bears. And I was in the San Diego Zoo back in the late 90s. And they had live pandas, which was really cool to see. And on display was a skull. Of a, of a panda. And as you can see from that picture, they have massive big canines. And there was a zoologist there giving a talk. And I went up to the zoologist and I said, oh, so this is the skull of a panda, yes. So they've got big canines, don't they? Yes. And I said to him, you know, if we didn't still have pandas alive today, if they were extinct and we just had the skull of a panda with these big canines, would you say he was a meat eater? Yes, we would, he said. But of course, you all know what pandas eat. They eat bamboo, right? But they use those big canines to tear the bamboo. Again, a classic example how fossils are often discovered, and we get told that this fossil, it was a violent, you know, take T-Rex, for example, Tyrannosaurus rex, big dinosaur. It was a violent meat-eating. Seriously, you cannot know that from the, from the teeth. And you certainly can't know that because you don't know what his brain was like. For all we know, T-Rex was a guy who just loved to come up and get tickled under the throat. You know what I mean? So, you know, science, so-called, makes up a lot of stuff. Who knows what this is? All oh, you Australians will know. There's the platypus. So, you know, in science, there are different orders. There are different members. There's mammals, there's reptiles, etc. right? We're mammals. And mammals give live young, they suckle their young, they're warm-blooded. But what's a platypus? The platypus, he's got mammalian features, but 
it lays eggs. So it's not a mammal, but it's not a reptile. It's a weirdo, absolute weirdo. To the point that this unusual appearance of this egg-laying, duck-billed, beaver-tailed, otter-footed mammal baffled European naturalists when they first encountered it. The first scientists to examine a preserved platypus body, and okay, this is a long time ago, but, but 1799, they said it was a fake made of several animals sewn together. But it is a complete, functioning, still alive animal created by God. Again, man comes up with these ideas of what things should be, but again, if, if, if a platypus was extinct, this would be regarded as a made-up thing. All right. So again, science doesn't always have the answers. The man on the screen, uh, he's called Benjamin Carson, an, an American gentleman. In his day, and he's, he's retired now, but not long ago, he was the top neurosurgeon in the world. Clever guy. Clever guy. He was actually the first scientist to come up with a way of separating Siamese twins joined at the head. People had tried, but as you can imagine, you know, it's not an easy job to separate twins joined at the head. It involved very complicated surgery, and there was always a great amount of blood loss, and usually both, certainly one, would die, and there'd be major brain damage left in the other. Well, he came up with a system where he could separate Siamese twins and preserve their life, and they would still actually have functioning lives. Wow, what a clever guy. But is he an, an evolutionist? No, he's a Bible-believing Christian. And he, he said this very simple thing. He said, you can't put a hurricane through a junkyard and get a 747. And that's basically, in short, what evolution teaches. Big bang, massive explosion, a whole lot of chemicals and dust and whatever, where that came from, no explanation, by the way. But big explosion of all this stuff. Next thing, you've got platypuses and humans and plants and dogs and planets and stars. Seriously. It, it's really no different than, you know, we're all taught the fantasy story about how you can kiss, kiss the frog and he'll turn into a prince. Is that real? No, of course not. It's a fantasy. But basically evolution is saying that story is true given enough time. We'll give it billions of years, and yep, you can get a frog to turn into a human being. It is bizarre. Evolution should have really been ditched many, many years ago. So as far as the Bible goes, coming back to the Bible, in the areas of prophecy, that is knowing the future, in the areas of history, science, and the way society lives, the hope that we have for the future... The Bible covers all those bases. It has the answers for all of those problems. And bear in mind the definition of what science is. Science, the definition of something that's scientific, is something that can be observed and replicated in a laboratory situation. Evolution cannot be observed and it cannot be replicated. Oh, they suppose this and that and they'll bombard generations of flies with radiation to try and replicate evolution. You know what you get? Flies, maybe without wings or with four wings or eight wings or six legs or nine legs or whatever, but you'll only ever get flies. So let's take a closer look at the Bible and the science of the Bible. The science of man, you know what? It has a habit of changing. The science of man said the earth was flat. Hey, guess what? It's not. The science of man said back in the day, you could cure people by bloodletting. In other words, bleeding them. Did that work? No. People just bleed to death. All right, because the Bible knew, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, the Bible knew the life is in the blood. You bloodlet, you take the life from someone. And, and we could go on, lots of areas like that. I want to start with this one. Psalm 8 verse 8 says, The birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and all that pass through the paths 
of the sea. The paths of the sea. Now, this was written by David about 1,000 BC. Right? More than 3,000 years ago, man had no idea, and it wasn't until really in recent times, the last couple of hundred years, we now know there are fixed ocean currents. There are literally paths in the sea that underwater animals take in their migration processes. The Bible knew it back in Psalms. And I mean, I'm just going to flick through just a selection of these scientific principles the Bible teaches. There are a lot more. We've got a book out there which details them all. But I'm just going to go through some of them. Job 26 verse 7 says, God stretches out the north over the empty place. He hung the earth on nothing. That describes the earth perfectly, doesn't it? It hangs in space, connected to nothing. Whereas, you know, the old science said, oh, the earth's on the back of an elephant or it's on the back of a turtle. Walk far enough, you'll fall off. That was the science of the day. Job knew, inspired by God, no, the earth hangs on nothing. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 7, all the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. And to the place from where the rivers come, there they return again. Again, that's a perfect description of the water cycle and evaporation that takes place from the sea, goes back to being a cloud, drops as rain, creates rivers back into the sea. Again, these scientific principles were not known. Um, The next one, Ecclesiastes 1 verse 6, says the wind goes toward the south, it turns around to the north, it whirls around continually and the wind returns on its circuits. The Bible teaches there, again about 1000 BC, the wind has fixed circuits. Again, we know that today. We call them the trade winds. Man did not know that. I mean, bear in mind, man didn't even know the earth was round until a few hundred years ago. He certainly hadn't um, circumnavigated it. So now we know there are fixed trade winds. Birds use those winds. Sailing ships use those winds. The Bible told us 3,000 years ago that they existed. How did the Bible know that if it's written by man? It's a good question, isn't it? Numbers 19 verses 11 and 12 talks about the quarantine principle. We actually know a lot about that now, don't we? Having gone through COVID, perhaps more than we we did. It says, he who touches the dead body of any man shall be unclean for seven days. If you touched a dead body, you were required to be unclean and you were to go outside of the camp of Israel, separated, quarantined effectively. And you were to purify yourself with the special... Um, sprinkling of water that included antibacterial products in it. You can read about that in Numbers. And on the third day, do that on the third day, and on the seventh day, to be examined by the priest and pronounced clean if you were then clean. You know, in the Middle Ages in Europe, lepers, amongst other um, very contagious viral diseases, were allowed to just walk around freely amongst the people. Plagues spread like wildfire. And it wasn't until this Old Testament principle was put in place of quarantine that plagues got stayed. But the Bible knew about this back in Moses' day, 1500 BC. I don't know if you've heard of this gentleman, Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis. He was a Hungarian doctor. And... He was in a a hospital, and women would come into the hospital to give birth and leave dead. Unheard of. Today, going to hospital to have a baby is sort of pretty common, isn't it? Pretty pretty easy. I think the mortality rate is, is next to nothing. But in those days, you went into hospital to have a baby, pretty much you came out dead. And Dr. Semmelweis was troubled by this. And what they would do, and like this is ridiculously bizarre, 
that they would examine dead bodies in the morgue and then without even washing their hands, go straight into the maternity ward and examine, often internally, pregnant women. No surprise, right? They died because those dead people died of something. So that what they were doing was carrying, as we know today, those diseases to the women who would die. So Dr. Semmelweis, and I believe he was probably inspired by God, although he may not have known it. He thought, you know, there's got to be a connection with this. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to institute a rigid hand-washing policy. Basic, all right? So doctors, colleagues, when you examine a dead body in the morgue, before you go to the maternity ward, you're to wash your hands. So he instituted this. Guess what? The mortality rate plummeted. He saved people's lives. But then, even though they were doing that, the mortality rate started spiking again. And he thought, well, maybe, and, and bearing in mind, this before they had microscopes, before they knew about germs, and this is in the 19th century, the mortality rate went up again. He thought, well, maybe there's something being transferred because, again, ridiculously bizarre, they would examine one woman and then without washing their hands, go and examine another woman. So what was happening now is that a disease was being passed on from one pregnant mother to another, and the mortality rate was spiking again. So he said, okay, there's something going on here. Now, what I want you to do, every time you examine one woman in the ward, you ought to wash your hands before you go to the next woman. They did this, guess what? The mortality rate plummeted again. Amazing. The Bible said to do that way back. If you're unclean, you're to go wash your hands. Now, we, now this is a basic thing, isn't it? We know how important that is. But in these days, they didn't understand about bacteriology, but it made a difference. But here's the sad part of the story. Dr. Semmelweis's colleagues were so put out by him, jealous, I think, of him, and the success, guess what? They refused to do it. And so poor old Dr. Semmelweis, because he saw the continued death that he knew he could prevent, he ended up in a mental institution, died, ironically enough, of a blood, blood issue. Now we look back on him, he's a, he's a hero. He's a, he's a hero of modern bacteriology. Basic, washing your hands, but the Bible told us about that centuries ago. Leviticus chapters 13 and 14 talked about the quarantine principle. And like I say, in the Middle Ages, this Jewish Old Testament biblical law saved the day. As I also mentioned earlier, Leviticus 17.11 says the life of every living thing is in the blood. We know that today, don't we? Because it's the oxygen, the hemoglobin in the blood joins to oxygen which carries the oxygen around our body, feeds the brain and all of our vital organs. They didn't know that until a couple of hundred years ago. And as I said, a common medical practice was bloodletting. Someone was sick, oh, we know what to do, we'll fix you. We'll get rid of your blood. That'll get rid of the disease. Yeah, that worked, didn't it? So again, the modern science of the day was far from the truth the Bible had already said 1500 BC, the life is in the blood. If people had listened, they wouldn't have practiced bloodletting. But isn't that amazing? The Bible knew about that. But you know what I think, even though these things are amazing, and we could go through lots of other sciences where the Bible knew, centuries, sometimes millennia, before man discovered it, well, it was there in the Bible to be discovered, but... You know, man likes to do his own thing. You know what is even more amazing than that? Is Israel. The nation of Israel. It is a miracle nation. It is a sign nation. Jeremiah 46 verse 28. And I'll go back a little bit before that. In the Old Testament, Leviticus and Deuteronomy, where God had chosen the nation of Israel, he'd given them his law, and he basically said... If you obey me, I will bless you. 
You'll be blessed in the field, you'll be blessed in your family, you'll be blessed in your business, every which way. But if you disobey me, I will curse you. And one of those curses would be that Israel would be scattered throughout all of the world and persecuted. God said, your name will be a byword. You will be regarded as a, as a cursed people. That was God warning them. Well, guess what happened? They disobeyed. So what did God do? He scattered them. But because God is God, and he always has the last laugh, he says in the prophet Jeremiah 46, he says, Fear not, Jacob, Israel, saith the Lord, I am with you. For I will make a full end of all nations where I have driven you, but I will not make a full end of you. I will correct you in measure, but I'll, yet will I not leave you wholly unpunished. So here was a promise of God. This is about 600 BC. You're going to be scattered, and this was just before they actually did get scattered to Babylon. They came back from there. Finally in AD 70, the Romans came through, ransacked Jerusalem, and the Jews disappeared off the map for the best part of 2,000 years. Israel did not exist. But God had promised, I will not make a full end of you. Now, this is unique. No other nation in the world has existed, been scattered through the world, ceased to exist, and then come back as a nation. And, you know, there was a lot of mighty nations contemporary with Israel. You know, you had the Hittites and the Jebusites, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, all of those other nations who had empires, they're gone. No one can, today can say, I'm a Babylonian, I'm a Hittite, I'm an Assyrian. They are gone. But guess what? In 1948, despite, despite Hitler's rampage against them and the millions and millions of people that he murdered and had you know, burnt up in the gas chambers and all that, Israel, 1948, they became a nation again. And they exist today as a thriving nation. I read an article not long ago and... It was talking about what the Jews have given to the world. You really should try and find it. There were literally thousands, you probably Google it very easily, thousands of things that we take for granted today that Jews developed and discovered. They are truly an amazing people who have given so much to the world. But the most amazing thing is, is that God said they would not be destroyed. They are back on the map again. Someone once said to me, uh, it was a chap who'd come to one of our night lectures, and I think I'd done a lecture on apologetics similar to this, and he came up to me afterwards, he was a, he was a skeptic, he says, listen, you let yourself be run over by a steamroller, and come back to life, then I'll believe. I said, so you'd believe if you saw one resurrection, would you? Yeah. I said, well, I can do better than that. I can give you six million resurrections. That's what Israel is. Six million people, roughly the population, was a nation that did not exist. The Bible said 2,000 years before, they would exist again. It is. It's a modern-day miracle. And to me, it's the king of biblical authority. In Isaiah 43, verse 10, God says about Israel, You are my witnesses, says the Lord. You're my servant whom I've chosen. And that's, that's what they are. You know, if you go into a courtroom and you've got a, a case to, to prove, you call witnesses, right? Eyewitnesses of your case. Well, that's what God has done with Israel. He said, You are going to be my witnesses to the world that I am God. And we've seen that in their restoration and in their prosperity that's come. You know, a lot of people, they contradict the Bible. Oh, sorry, they criticize the Bible. They say, oh, the Bible's full of contradictions. You know, one gospel says there was one angel. And another gospel says there was two angels at the tomb and this and that and this and that. Well, I've spent years and debated with a lot of people, looked at every contradiction anyone's ever put in front of me and you know what if you look at the bible they've all got answers and you know what it's like it's often just a matter of 
the gospel writings being about slightly different timelines in the same story. So yes, there was one angel there at the start, but there was two later, or, or, or vice versa. So you know these contradictions that people come up with, they never hold water, and they're really not very objective. You know, C.S. Lewis said, and he was a Christian, um, you'll know C.S. Lewis because he wrote the Narnia Chronicles. Um, our children read those, I've read those, they've been turned into movies, they're, they're world famous. But you know, if you're a Christian, the Narnia Chronicles isn't just a little story. It's the Bible story. You've got the lion is the hero. Well, who's that? That's the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's Jesus. You know, you've got the princes who end up ruling the world. Guess who that is? That's the saints. You've got the evil witch. You know, guess who that is? That's the mother. Oh, no, so that's the, um, the, the evil nature within us. You know, so C.S. Lewis isn't just writing a story. He's actually giving the biblical story. So he was a Christian gentleman. He said this, and he's written a lot of, of Christian ap apologetic stuff, but I like this. Christianity, if false, it's of no importance. Forget it. But if true, it is of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. I hope you get that. Because if there's a God, if he's real, and he made me, and he has promised eternity to me, and he's given me evidence in his word, in creation, in science, he cares that much, then it is of infinite importance that I get to know that God, I fall into line with his rules and submit to him. He owns me. Now, if you can prove the Bible is a load of rubbish, there is no God, we all evolved, go for your life, fill your boots. I'd like to see that evidence. And if you're right, let's drop the whole thing. Let's just go and eat, drink, and be merry. The problem really is, as G.K. Chesterton put it, and he's another um, famous writer, um, again, another Christian. It's amazing how many famous people are Christians. Don't know if you realise that. The Wright brothers, what were they famous for? Flight, Christians. Gregor Mendel, Mendel the, the father of genetics, Christian. Florence Nightingale, heard of her? What's she famous for? Basically creating nursing. Uh, up until World War I, when she started looking after soldiers and that sort of thing, there, there were no nurses. There was no blankets and, and health care. It was rugged. She was a Christian. And if you read her memoirs, she actually believed she was led by God to do what she was doing. Isaac Newton, still regarded as the most famous scientist of all time, and he's about 400 years ago, Bible believing, and I'll put this in as well, monotheistic Christian. Didn't believe that lie of the Trinity. Monotheistic Christian. And, and, I, and I could go on. All these famous guys. So anyway, G.K. Chesterton, the Christian ideal, he says, it's not been tried and found wanting. It's been felt, found difficult and left untried. I like that. And those of us who are Christians, we can say amen to that. It's not easy. Because guess what? You're swimming against the tide. You're having to go against your own evil nature. It's not easy, but it's right, isn't it? So for a lot of people, yeah, they criticize it, but they've never, they've never tried it. This scripture, Psalm 34 verse 8, says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. I think a lot of you have probably traveled, um, particularly overseas, and particularly, I reckon, um, the, the, the sort of Asia Asia area, although other countries, the suppliers. You'll travel to another country and you'll always come across foods that you've never had before, right? Oh, that's what I love, actually, about, about travel. You get to try these foods. And have you ever had the experience where there's a food and you maybe, you take a look at it and think, yeah, I ain't trying that. But, you know, you summon up enough courage, you sort of say, oh, well, I'm, I'm here, the locals eat it. I suppose I'll give it a go, it'll be an experience, you know. And you eat it, and wow, your taste buds go to seventh heaven. 
you've just discovered something, you've just tasted something that is amazing. And every time you go back to the same place, you want to have exactly the same thing. Ever had that experience? Well, you know, God is like that. But the trouble is, a lot of people have never summoned up, whether it be the courage or the humility, whatever it is, to taste God. Because if you can just get a taste of him in your life and have the experience of him working for you and forgiving you and setting you free, leading you to places, answering your prayers, it is like having that, that gastronomic experience of having that nice new food. So I would encourage everyone, taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, our God, the proved, factual, existing God, he's prepared to overlook. So if anyone's sitting there going, well, yeah, I'd quite like to look into God or, or be committed to God, but you know what, I'm, I'm a pretty bad person. Well, guess what? He's prepared to overlook your ignorance, prepared to overlook when you didn't obey him, and he's prepared to forgive you, but the ball's in our court. We've got to repent. It's simple. You just say, God, sorry, I'm a sinner. Admit that, and he will forgive us. And you know what? He's appointed a day in which he's going to send his son to be the judge of this earth. The dead are going to be raised, and we're all going to be judged. And when Peter told this to Israel way back in the first century, Hearing it, they were stabbed in their heart. They were convicted. And they said to them, what shall we do? Wow. Would to God we heard that more, eh? That people said, you know what? What you're saying is true. What, what do I need to do? And he said, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. So for anyone who is hearing this, maybe, maybe for the first time, maybe you've heard it before, but you know you're not quite where you need to be with that awesome God who created you, just repent. If you haven't been baptized, get baptized. Have your sins washed away. Get identified with the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. The final word I'm going to give back to C.S. Lewis again. And I think, again, he makes a very good point here. He says, a proud man, he's always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you're looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. So true. The pride of man. It is a major stumbling block to us. It stops us from bowing our knee to the Lord because we want our own way. And you know how I know that? Because that's me too. Even now, I struggle. We all struggle with pride. But before I got converted, oh, it took me months before all this factual information, I actually had the humility to say, oh, I've got to do something about this. I kept arguing. But you know what the main problem was? And I can still remember this. I can still remember thinking, you know what? If I acknowledge this, if I bow my knee to this God that I'm being talked to about, you know what? I've got to stop doing what I want to do. And I've got stuff I want to do. I've got my ambitions. I want this. I want that. And I knew you bow the knee to the Lord. One of the principles of that is not my will, but yours be done. But praise God, um, honesty and common sense <laughs> came through. And I finally came to the point where I thought, you know what? It is just dishonest for me to be pretending and just trying to sweep all this information under the carpet, all this fact that we've looked at. And this, this is just a summary of it, of course. We've got longer, longer lectures specifically on, on these given subjects. So this is just a summary. But, you know, if we keep trying to sweep that in, that's, that's dishonest. Who likes a dishonest person? Nobody. So let's be honest. And it's like the Bible said. This is paraphrasing it, but it's in Isaiah, God says to, to Israel, he says, put up or shut up. He says, come and show me, you know, show me all your gods or hear what I'm saying to you and say, it's truth. And if something is truth, it's dishonest to not follow through with that. 
So like C.S. Lewis says, let's be humble people. Let's be looking up because that's, that's where our God is. He's living in the heavenlies and we can live there with him as well. Amen.